Welcome to Exagility. I'm your host, John Coleman. Jorgen Apollo, welcome to the Exagility podcast. Uh, how are you doing today? Hello, John. I'm, I'm fine. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Delighted to have you here. I've been interested in your work since Management 3.0. There's a particular technique within Management 3.0 that I really love, Delegation Poker. I teach that a lot. So the Scrum.org people actually have it built into their leadership class as one of the techniques that's really helpful for managers to uh, to be honest about the levels of delegation depending on the decision. Uh, so that was a really cool technique, and thank you for that. And even back in the, your days of Management 3.0, I did notice... A theme of playfulness, uh, the videos on YouTube, very well put together, very playful looking images and fonts even. Even the way you appeared on your TEDx talk, you know, your white shoes and your color t-shirt under the kind of a different shirt is, it was uh, playfulness was, was coming true in your presentation as well. And I actually read out some of the things that you had and, and your kind of the summary of your TEDx talk. You said, well, we need to we need to build for meaning and we need to innovate management. So uh, manage differently. You actually give examples of people rolling the dice, for example, to figure out whether they're going to get their bonus this month or next month or whatever, which is kind of nice because uh, uh, you might have it spent already. Accelerating learning, which a lot of people would be familiar with. Running experiments, embracing playfulness, which is uh, something I don't hear a lot about. Uh, only a few people in the community that I hear talking like that. And nurture happiness that really rings a bell for me happy people serving happy customers and of course managing the system and the way you told the story of course is very well put together but playfulness really came true in the whole talk and it's kind of interesting that you've come to unfix at this point which seems to be kind of manifesting that playfulness at scale is that a good way of summarizing it uh, jorgen it is sort of the thread <laughs> through everything that I have done. I'm, I'm not sure why, where it came from, but I felt the need to be colorful and playful in my work, just to be remarkable and make it uh, distinguishable from the boring old management and leadership stuff of which there is so much out there. I mean, just open any website on management and leadership and you'll see dark gray, dark, blue colors usually and and it's also it's all it's very bland and and uninspiring so yeah from the very first day i thought i want to be i want to be the colorful person i want to be the the playful person just to set myself apart from all that uninspiring stuff even with the website the unfix website i went to unfix.com today and went on and it was like i just wanted to play with things i think you described it as lego blocks that's really what it feels like it's you've put together a model that really is people just want to play with and it's very simple to look at but there's a lot of depth to it as well there's a lot of breadth to it and you're you're building it out obviously as you go along because it's quite new still but still a lot there for a framework that's only maybe a, a year and a maybe a year and a half old at this point so um, September 2021 was the first beta version of a picture that I collected feedback on. And then I, the website was launched January 2022. And so OnFix seems to be inspired by team topologies. That was something I noticed immediately when I looked at it. And I actually thought that it was very, very close to top team topologies. And I had a closer look. I, in fact, you even have an article about how to unfix team topologies and I thought, hang on a second, I thought unfix was based on team topologies, but you seem to have found quite a few differences, uh, quite a list actually. I wouldn't say unfixing team topologies because it is already a, a very small pattern library and that's what unfix is as well. And I'm inspired by lots of different sources, dynamic reteaming and the book Network Scale and Agile and lots of other sources. But indeed, the team topologies is an obvious one because they did a great job. Uh, Matthew Skelton and, and Manuel Pais uh, with uh, the four team types that they have found. It's just that I go broad, wide, where they go deep 
into interaction modes and, and nearly all the examples are IT based in team topologies. And I want us to steer clear of that because I want a more holistic a pattern library that can apply to any kind of organization, whether it is a circus or a hospital or a fire department, I don't care. Everyone collaborates and everyone is trying to create experiences for customers or users or clients. So I try to go in other directions where team topologies hasn't gone, but there is an overlap. And those are the four team types that they also found. I mean, they have not invented the team types. They found these these four patterns that seem to be good patterns in organizations and they named them. And I borrowed the same patterns, gave them slightly different names because I had some reasons for that. And then I went to other sources to collect other kinds of inspiration. I noticed also that there seems to be some inspiration from dynamic reteaming as well. Something that I misunderstood mm -hmm. for a long time until I did the research to study Heidi's book before I interviewed her. And what I say to people is you, you need to be almost authentic about doing reteaming, that it's it's not just about people think it's just throwing people, throwing teams around every sprint or whatever, or whatever you call it. If that's not the way it is. It's a bit more intentional than that. How do you make sure that people can actually work together? She even talked about uh, strange names like promiscuous pairing and things like that, where people actually work with uh, all the people that kind of intensively and get used to the idea of building up teaming as a skill, actually. Just the way airline pilots get together, they, they can work together because of their intensive training. Can we learn this? But what was your reason for bringing dynamic reteaming into the fold on, under Onfix? Well, I saw the same things, I think, as uh, Heidi saw. There's so much change in the world outside. We have one crisis after the other. I mean, we've gone from a pandemic to a, a war in Europe and an energy crisis. And now there is uh, AI coming that is revolutionizing business. And it's is one thing after the other. You, you you barely have time to catch your breath as a company and you have to adapt to something else. And that constant adaptation means that we have to restructure on the inside. We have to be more flexible in how we organize ourselves. We cannot afford ourselves the luxury of static steady teams for a very long time if we have to offer a different kind of experience a different kind of value to stakeholders customers and users it means we probably have to form different kinds of teams now the observation that heidi has has made and that i also buy into is that it is not steady teams versus uh, dynamic teams the, this is a false dichotomy if you think of the concept of team of teams, so a whole book on that, and General McChrystal came up with that concept, then you can look at it at two different levels. So for example, you could have a, a team of 20-ish people that take care of the forming, storming, norming, performing, the onboarding and everything in terms of psychological safety and trust and respect and so on, the stuff that we expect from a company that is agile, that buys into the agile uh, values and principles. And then at a smaller scale, the smaller units of three, four, five people, they could do reteaming within that team of teams. So you have a larger team and smaller sub teams as a combination of two different patterns, actually at two different levels. And then you don't need to do team building exercises and trust exercises for three or four people because they already know how to work with each other because they have been reteaming continuously within that larger group of 20. And you see this happening at companies where they do fluid scrum, for example, the sw teams swarming to uh, sprint goals in a group of 20, 30, 40 people where everyone knows each other, but every sprint they make a different combination of, of people that sign up to a certain sprint goal. But that that is, again, a team of, of smaller teams. They have similar practice at in Tesla factories. Joe Justice uh, does keynotes on, on the topic of how at a Tesla factory, they form small teams for a time duration of three hours. They sign up to certain tasks and and then they reteam after three hours in a different combination. And then he says, within a couple of weeks, you've worked with everyone in the factory and you worked on 
paint and engines and AI and, and whatever. So learning goes through the roof and it makes the whole factory a very resilient, very adaptable system. So there are benefits to allowing or, or practicing reteaming. It's sure it is a skill that you need to develop and Heidi explains that in her book. And I embrace the same, the same idea, facilitate the reteam. Don't be too dogmatic in terms of uh, thou shalt have a static team, otherwise thou destroys velocity. Well, that is a very narrow-minded interpretation, I think, of the Agile Manifesto. Thank you, Jürgen. Before I go through the model itself, I need to ask you why you called it on fix. <laughs> well, I was inspired by SAFE, the Scaled Agile Framework, for having a very, very good name. For all its flaws, one thing it does, has done well is, is pick a name that that resonates with its intended target audience. So people who want to play it safe, they buy into safe because it promises certainty and, and security and things like that. So uh, thumbs up for the marketing. <laughs> I thought I, I want an, a name that is also simple and feels good and reflects what it is and sells to the intended target audience, which is people who realize that they need to be more flexible in the organization, that we have to adapt continuously. And uh, I had the letter I of innovation. I thought that was an important letter to have. I had the X of experience, because for me, everything is about the customer experience, the user experience, the employee experience, and so on. I think it goes beyond product, the experience. So then I thought, okay, what word can I make with I and X? Well. Fix uh, the framework for innovation and experience, but no, it's not a framework. It's it's a pattern library. It's an unframework. Wait a minute, unfix. That's it, unfix. That's unstructuring things, being flexible, and um, you can use it as a verb, as people are already doing. Let's unfix this organization. <laughs> And fortunately, the domain name was for sale, so I thought, well, that's it. Now, now I I need to have this one. <laughs> so you, you kind of made a strong point there that it's not a framework. So wh why is it that you make that point so strongly? What What is it about being a framework that is uh, make, make basically not suiting on fix? Well, frameworks are things you install. Think .NET framework. That's something that you install on your computer. That's the whole idea of a framework, that it is something that has a static, rigid structure, and then within it, it allows moving things around. But the word frame itself in framework indicates what the idea is. You have something that holds it all together. That is the the definition of framework is you have something that holds everything together. And with a pattern library, it it's it's not like that. You have nothing holding it all together. You have just a lot of options, a lot of things that you can choose from. So for example, team topologies is a pattern library. Liberating structures is a pattern library. So Shocracy 3.0 is a pattern library. They're not frameworks. There is nothing to install. You just have a number of suggestions, options, and you pick and choose. You implement the individual patterns, not an entire framework. So that is an important distinction. And it also, serves the idea of decompose and recombine, which is a, a, a thing that's going on now in the Agile community uh, based on complexity thinking. Uh, frameworks are too large, too, too static. Yeah, we have to decompose them, deconstruct them into their individual parts and then offer people all those parts and then recombine them. I'm not the only one with that inside. Uh, Ivar Jacobson has his Essence project going on, for example, the same, same conclusions. So I find it important that we, we don't call things a framework. But to be honest, it is a word so easily used in our community. People use it for basically anything that is actually a model, not a framework. People call any model nowadays a framework, but I try to stick to the correct terminology here. Pattern libraries are models as well. Model is a very neutral term, very, very common word. Everything is a model, but frameworks are very specific ones that, that require installing and you don't install on fix. 
Thanks, Sergeant. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try to walk through the model. Sure. But before we kind of go into it, there's some basic things like people talk about in other approaches that might talk about teams or squads. Uh, you chose to use the word crew, which I think isn't a bad shout, actually, because it's kind of team can be a loaded term sometimes you've got a, a group of people together that actually don't really have a common objective and so maybe it's uh we're all a team and then everybody you know s separates after their daily get together whatever not really a team but I, maybe that wasn't your reason but that I, it kind of resonates with me but what i'm curious about is what do people use at a crew level so like i i i didn't notice anything maybe it's maybe unfix is silent about that like in terms of do they use any approach or uh is there any so you mentioned that unfix is a, like a pattern library right so there's a set of patterns so are there patterns also for what an individual crew would do like even if you just had one crew what would they do on a given week monday to friday would they be just doing work all week or do they have any kind of things going on during the week as well no, this is undefined at this moment. I try not to uh, offer patterns for everything that is going on in an organization at this time. Yeah. Though the model is going to expand, I'm working on a next major uh, version that should come out uh, by the end of the summer. But I started out with organization design patterns because in my opinion, what we had sucked in the various frameworks and other pattern libraries out there. So I thought it was easy for me to make difference there mm -hmm. uh, and offer something that was better than what we already had in, in other uh, approaches. So you could say that was my, my beachhead market <laughs> was the organizational structure. That was a starting point. Of course, people then asked, okay, but what about process patterns? What about communication, collaboration patterns and so on? Sure, things are coming up. The Lego box is expanding. I use that metaphor all the time because we need more options. We need more suggestions. But I started specifically with a structural patterns for that reason that I needed a starting point. But it could also be an advantage as well, couldn't it, particularly for like the product management community, for example. There's really no one kind of unified approach to product management. You've got lots of thought leaders saying you should do it different ways, but they like to be a bit more flexible in terms of how they work. So it could be to your advantage, actually. And if you do introduce those options later on, I guess you're going to make those optional as well, just like what's in what I see at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So if I walk through the, the model, then I'm going to try and for the audience, try to translate some of the expressions, but I might do a very bad job, Jorgen. So please correct me when I make mistakes. But I think base is similar to a tribe. I've heard a tribe expression before, or team of teams, if you like. And then there seem to be different types of crew in the tribe. And also there seems to be, for example, there's a value stream crew. So I guess that's a a group of people working together. So they're working in marketing, for example, they're working in changing the product packaging for a shampoo bottle. You'd have people working on the, maybe the ideas in terms of the design for the shampoo bottle, the, the people who actually make that shampoo bottle happen, you know, all the communications people, there might be something, I don't know. That, I'm just thinking that could be a value stream in marketing. If it was an IT system, there could be a number of teams stringing together and together they produce some value, some app or some website or something like that. And then I noticed a capability crew and I was thinking, well, if that was in marketing, an example of that would be maybe a brand style guide type team, uh, some team worried about, are we on brand message? You know, when we send out communication, are we using the right fonts, are we using the right icons and things like that? Do we use the right logos and stuff like that? The value stream crew is your average scrum team, Kanban team, the stream align team, as they call it in team topologies. It is hopefully the default kind of a team that you would use because these people have responsibility of delivering value to customers i prefer calling it creating an experience uh, or part of an experience for external stakeholders so hopefully most are of that type that that pattern but there are exceptions and indeed you mentioned the capability crew uh, which is very close to the complicated subsystem team in team topologies the idea here is that sometimes you have people with rare skills capabilities something that is needed every now and then on the other teams but you don't have many of these people walking around like i don't know two cybersecurity 
people or two UX with a lot of mach yeah. machine learning knowledge or whatever. These people are very expensive in the market. You're glad to have two while you might have 15 scrum teams and there's not a, enough work for 15 machine learning specialists and you don't even have them. But every now and then they need to be with the others. It could also be one person with legal expertise. You don't want to teach 15 scrum teams all the expertise in legal and finance matters on their project. This is not their thing. They want, they want to create value and every now and then they need the person with all that expertise to get things going on their value stream. So for me, the bottleneck here is, is the capability of that person or these people who will just have to hover around, be with the teams where their skills are needed for the time being to deliver value. This is an exceptional pattern. So the fewer you have of these, the better, because you recognize that they are bottlenecks. But hey, this is the best we can do at this moment. We, we don't even want to teach all those 15 people all those cybersecurity skills because that's just cognitive overload. That, in, in that, I agree with team topologies where they say this is just too much cognitive load for a team. And the only area where I differ a little bit is that in team topologies, they call this the complicated subsystem team because the assumption is that there is a subsystem that these people take care of that required maintenance and development, etc. And I say, well, it is, it is irrelevant whether there is a subsystem or not. Uh, the, the bottleneck is the expertise of these people. And so let's just call it a capability crew. That is the capability that they, that they offer to the other teams. Yeah. So then you also have experience crew. Is that about employee experience? Well, what do you mean by that? No, no, that is the experience for customers and users. And as I said before, I want to go a step further than just delivering a product to a customer. Customers are not interested in products. They are interested in their experiences for which they use your product. I have been very much inspired by the jobs to be done community that always says customers hire your product to get a job done. That is their way of phrasing. They want an experience in their life. They want a brief fleeting moment of happiness throughout their day. And the job of your product is to enable that, that experience. So the experience crew very much looks at what is the intended experience of customers and do we achieve that? And, and this is most important, where could things go wrong when we have multiple teams with multiple product areas or maybe even multiple products offering different touch points in the entire customer journey. My favorite example that I often use is a banking transaction that I had to make for which I had to use an app of the bank and the website because I had to change my password. And of course, things were not integrated well. So I was bouncing back and forth between the app and the website who were referring to each other. And I wasted half an hour of my life making just one transaction <laughs> that afternoon. And that was, I think, the typical outcome of an agile transformation. We have agile islands, as I, as I call them, islands of agility, where the website is created by an agile team and the app is made by an agile team. And individually, they do a great job, lots of releases, continuous deployment, and so on. But the customer is not interested in an app or in a website, they wanna make a transaction. That is the only thing they're interested in. They wanna make a financial transaction and it is impossible because these two teams apparently have not coordinated the experience. And that is what an experience crew is for to, through data analysis, customer journey mapping, user journey mapping, and, and so on, service design experts. These are people who look at what is the, the lived experience of users and, and customers. And that goes beyond what we normally expect of product owners and, and product managers who tend to look more at the product, not at the experience and their product areas or their islands of the product that they deliver. Understood. 
And I also noticed there's a partnership crew. Would that be for like large organizations, for example, where you got loads of compliance people, uh, controls, like, I don't know, information security, architecture, procurement? You know, there's rules um, of the company. Is, is that what it's designed for, Jürgen? Or yeah, it- I realized that when I have an experienced crew on one side of the picture, looking at the experience of the ones that we offer value to the customers and users, it would be good to have this balanced approach in the pattern set and have the same pattern on the other side, offering a decent experience to our vendors and suppliers and gig workers and anyone that we depend on who deliver value to us because, well, I have been a entrepreneur for 13 years and I have some stories of really bad treatment <laughs> by customers of me as a supplier where I said at some point, you know what, F <laughs> W N and et cetera, I go somewhere else. You can go find your supplier with another person. And I think some organizations would benefit from a more respectful approach towards the the companies and the vendors that they depend on. A very concrete example, streaming is now such a commodity with Netflix having competitors, Disney+, Plus, HBO, Amazon Prime, you name it. I'm pretty sure that they have some people making sure that the TV producers, the TV series makers have a good experience working with Netflix because they can choose which streaming platform they want to work with. And so Netflix better treat them well or else they go to Amazon Prime. That is what I mean with you need to offer a good experience to the ones that you depend on in order to run your business. Thank you. And then I see a platform crew as well. What's interesting in the diagram is while the value stream teams, the partnership crew, experience crew, and the facilitation crew we haven't talked about yet, they seem to be on some turf, but the platform crew seems to be on the base, you know, the tribe, if you like. And I'm guessing an example of that might be if I was in a bank, for example, maybe they're using something like Salesforce or some other customer relationship management system in the back end or something like that. Is that what you had in mind there, Jürgen? Platform crew is same as in team topologies. It's any team that offers a service internally. Basically seeing the employees as their customers and offering something on demand or on a self-service basis. And the typical examples are infrastructure, indeed SaaS tools or whatever you offer to the employees that they can work with. However, I always offer the example of a kindergarten, which is a service that I once saw at a company of 100 people with lots of young employees. Many of them had babies and toddlers, and they could bring them to the office because they had kindergarten on site. Well, that is a perfect example of a platform crew because they offer a service to the employees themselves. And that is a non-IT server. That would be that was a human service, but it's a fine example of what a platform crew can mean. It is the idea of we take the worries off of your mind. You focus on the value that you create for customers and users. We take care of your infrastructure, your babies, (laughs) whatever. And that's what platform crews do. Thank you. I also noticed forums, which seem to be your version of communities of practice for kind of sharing concerns. And you have a place as well for facilitation, but also for governance. So let's talk about facilitation. First of all, in the agile world, for example, they would have these people like scrum masters and coaches and people like that, and just professional facilitators as well. Is is that what you had in mind when you were talking about facilitation crew? Yeah, the metaphor that I often use is the personal trainer, someone who knows that they should be able to do these exercises and all that work themselves, but they like having someone around who keeps raising the bar for them. And the typical example is indeed agile coaches and of course, scrum masters, whatever, but the same could apply to product owners helping out five scrum teams with the coordination of their backlogs across the five teams or whatever. In theory, the team should be able to do this themselves, but it is nice to have one or two product owners helping them out with that. And there's other examples that we could come up with, but these are the obvious examples in an agile context. The difference with capability crew is that in the case of facilitation crew or the enabling team and team topologies, 
people should be able to do this themselves. So it is not so much a cognitive load issue. The idea is that like with the personal trainer, you're teaching people to do this themselves. You should be able to walk away and say, okay, that was it. This was a temporary thing. Now you're on your own, but I am pretty relaxed with the definition of temporary. For me, it can also be semi-permanent because when I look at my spouse, he has a personal trainer. I can tell you when the personal trainer is on vacation, no exercise happens. And uh, then I say, well, you could go have a run or something. No, no, I, I prefer to wait when the personal trainer is back. <laughs> so there is no real need to depend on the personal trainer, but some people like having others around to help them raise the bar and go through the motions and so on. And I think there's actually nothing, nothing wrong with that, with people appreciating agile coaches and product owners who uh, help them get their work done. So there's a different attitude, a different approach that a facilitation crew has compared to a capability crew where it's really special skills that you don't even want to teach to the value stream crews because it would just overload their brain. And I've noticed as well in, I think most of the crew types, uh, you've got a captain. It's an optional captain, captain, I guess. But what would that be equivalent to the pre fix world? Because you've got people doing the work, I guess, and you've got captains. What would be the closest thing to a captain before Unfix came along? Well, first of all, you said the word optional. That's important. Everything is optional. So each pattern that we discussed so far is optional. That is the idea of a Lego box, right? And then there's not a single Lego block that is mandatory. Some are more obvious than others. So for sure, you will use a couple of them much more often than others but none of them are mandatory. The captain idea is actually borrowed from the Spotify model where there's a squad leader, if I remember well. And I saw it in other places too. Another example that inspired me was the pilot on a plane. The pilot is not the manager of the people on the plane, of the stewards and stewardesses. He or she does not decide how much everyone gets paid, does not do one-on-ones, <laughs> is not part of the HR process, no, that person, the pilot, has the responsibility for the journey, for making sure we get from A to B. And then that person has certain responsibilities, also particularly to the outside world, first point of contact with the tower and so on. So I saw that as a pattern that I see every now and then, that you have one person on the team who has the mission lead role. There's one particular company, Pipe Drive, I, I created a case study with them a year ago, where they call them the mission lead. That person for the duration of the mission is the leader, but this role rotates continuously. People can volunteer to be the leader on the next mission. It is not a management job. It is not about salaries or career advancement or whatever. In fact, they expect all the engineers every now and then to pick up the mission lead role so that there's decent amount of rotation going on. But it's good to have that one person pulling that particular mission so that someone else can pull the card in with another mission. I find it a useful pattern. And again, it is option. Yeah, it's a very playful just even to look at for anyone who wants to go into the website, unfix.com. Just a reminder as well, there's a conference coming up this year, isn't there, Jorgen, at the Unfix conference. Can you tell us a bit more about that? So it's in November. I don't know the exact dates off the top of my head. Shame on me. But it will be in Berlin where for two days we're going to discuss anything related to Unfix, whether it is reteaming or organizational structure or the new patterns that are coming up in terms of process and network goal setting and so on. So for two days, lots of fun. Second time was last year. It was also organized in Berlin. That was sort of the prototype, the MVP event, <laughs> and we succeeded quite well. So we're going to repeat it. Something really notable for the audience of the x podcast in the Unfix model, you've got a governance crew. So it seems to me like you've got a place for the management team. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? 
Correct. Well, you know, John, that I did this management theater other thing for 10 years or so that sort of put me on the map in the agile community. And yeah, I always say manage the system, not the people. Someone has to define the constraints on the self-organizing crowd, like, are we going to do reteaming or not? What are the rules for reteaming? For example, the example I just gave of pipe drive, where they decided, okay, we're going to do reteaming and we have missions. And then there is for each mission, there will be a mission lead. And we're going to do uh, volunteering and swarming and so on. Someone has thought about that. <laughs> and that is typically, I think, a management job. I call it the governance crew. The chiefs are in the governance crew. They manage the system. Then they let the crowd do its job with whatever constraints they put in place and they should try and stay out of all the other crews so no managers on any of the other crews because as soon as you have a management position somewhere else you just created a territory that someone will try to protect and that's going to make it very difficult to change things which was the whole idea of being unfixed with your organizational structure so i very much advocate having the managers up there in the blue box in the governance crew as the managers of the base indeed and the other crews do the reteaming and figuring out the boundaries and so on and I also noticed that you seem to think about, well, what happens if you have multiple bases? I saw a reference to leagues and clusters. So it seems you've thought about that. You've even thought beyond that about coalitions of leagues, I believe, and Congress even. Uh, it's kind of like, yep. a, almost like a representatives, I guess, from different leagues on, on Congress, is it? Or is it from bases? I wasn't sure. But I'd say you had fun putting that together. How long did it take you to think about all that, actually? Because that, that was kind of really innovative ideas. To be honest, that part is actually still in development. So the terminology is still under discussion. I, I focus at the base level mostly for the last year or, or so. But we do have ideas on how this could scale in a fractal way because i find that very important when we want organizations to be network organizations things need to be self-similar at scale that's what i learned from complexity science network theory and so on and i've been very inspired by a chinese company hire where i've been 11 12 years ago on invitation and they are truly a network organization and they do not have a hierarchy of 10 11 12 layers as many other enterprises they expect their 4000 micro enterprises i would call them bases but they call them micro enterprises to collaborate horizontally in a network as a swarm of mini companies. But interestingly enough, if you look at how these 4,000 mini companies behave, it's very similar to how people behave in a base. Because some of those micro enterprises behave as platform units. They offer services to the rest of the network. Internet of Things technology, for example. Some of those micro enterprises very much focus on customer experiences. They, they collect data about preferences of people and sell that data to the other micro enterprises. Some of them are on the other side. They are the, the partnership units. They work with the universities and others and bring in innovation into the network. So I saw the same patterns repeat at the next level so in, instead of the platform crew within the base at the next level up you would have a platform cluster which is a couple of bases together that act as a platform cluster offering services together to the rest of the network and then indeed you have a fractal design now this is mostly theoretical i see it more or less implemented with hire the chinese company but to be honest i haven't seen it anywhere else yet so they are a great inspiration of what is possible i tried to get rid of the hierarchy and uh, the matrix structure which comes with significant uh, drawbacks and most organizations have matrices or matrices and we need to offer an alternative when it comes to scaling true network organizations need a different approach that is self-similar at scale and that's what we try to achieve with these patterns something else i noticed as well jorgen i'm not sure if i just haven't studied it enough yet but i didn't notice that much talk about projects or product or maybe it's because it's not a major concern because you're more interested in the experience but can you talk a little bit about that because i think i noticed in some of the example diagrams you had some projects 
in the value stream crews, for example, and I'm, I'm guessing there could be very well be products or services as well in those value stream crews. Did it pop up at all when you were designing the model, whether you're going to give any direction or guidance to organizations about what they should be doing about projects and products and all that type of stuff? So, as I said, I started with organizational structure and not with projects or products, because I thought there's already so much out there. Why bother describing that? I also did not describe anything about retrospectives because there's a ton of material on retros. Why should I cover the same territory? I only want to offer things in the model when I think I am now one step ahead of everything else out there with the patches that I offer. So uh, no, I haven't touched upon projects or products, how to define those. I just call it experience and value. Those are the terms that we use and how you want to cut that up, that value, that experience in different products or different projects that is up to you for now. But yeah, uh, new stuff is coming up. <laughs> First thing that we're working on is objectives, vision, mission, objectives, initiatives, and how that turns into backlogs. So it is on the horizon. Very good. One thing that really struck me as well when I was reviewing Unfix, the clarity that it provides, and again, playfulness coming true, but even simple cards for displaying how much I'm going to be participating with this crew, for example, just the clarity with that, you know, what does part-time mean? You even kind of have different ways of describing that time commitments even i think i think i know some cards as well for time commitments you had some principles as well you even had the different life cycle stages of a value stream you know what stage are they at you know that gang over there they're at stage three they're, they're stage six and things so lots of clarity lots of transparency credit to you for making something that's normally very boring much more playful so kudos for that and keeping the playfulness in there and i think it is something worth exploring actually myself i think it's quite interesting what you're doing but the question is going to be on lots of people's minds is about case studies and i believe you had some organizations that were kind of already working that way anyway so you could kind of say well actually they were doing this for many years but i believe you might have had one or two case studies recently is that right as in like people t t deployed on fix since you launched it and they've actually already got something something to say about it yeah so these are now popping up we had to wait of course a bit for organizations to discover the unfixed model and then start experimenting with yeah. things and then reporting back. I have a team working on the case studies while I develop the model, paving the way for everyone. And indeed, in the beginning, we just looked at organizations that already existed and use the patterns already because I didn't invent any. I just described what is already happening. I often use as the example or the great inspiration the book by christopher alexander a pattern language which was released in the 70s of last century where he described the patterns of urban planning and architecture in cities well cities already existed before the book it is not that cities were implementing the book no it is the book describing the good stuff that happened in livable cities and the same treatment should be given to the unfixed model which just reports this is good stuff that good organizations are already doing so i think we'll get more case studies actually of companies that have already defined their own approach where we simply can map the pattern language that we have onto the stuff that they have already been doing and have been quite successful with their approach but yeah as you said the first case studies are now coming up and we have a few more in the pipeline i understand that will be published very soon about the first experimentation of companies with the unfixed model but it is not implementation as i keep reminding people it is not a framework to be implemented it is a lego box to be played with and then i hope every organization creates their own framework actually that's sort of my motto make your own method make your own framework because there's so much you can do with the same options uh, same patterns Sounds really nice. Uh, just one final thing as well. The bane of delivery and discovery and lots of organizations are dependencies, but you also seem to have some patterns for breaking dependencies. So it's, it's really cool what you've done. Like you've got all these little tools and bits and bobs that are kind of helping people to kind of break through the complicatedness of getting stuff done. 
kudos. Yeah, that is sort of my favorite work, to be honest. I love the digging around. I love the analysis of what good stuff is already happening out there. What are the patterns? I just did that this week on, on meetings, for example. Why do we have meetings? What is the intent behind meetings? And I found so many different suggestions from Scrum to Kanban, less and sociocracy and holacracy, but also more traditional overviews. And then I map them all together and I align them and figure out, okay, well, so these are sort of the, the patterns that I see across all those methods and frameworks. We have planning meetings, we have retro meetings, we have problem solving meetings and decision making meetings and so on. And then you have this big spreadsheet <laughs> with the options that will then be added to the unfixed model at some point where we give each option a name with the benefits and the drawbacks and use in this case, don't use in that case, hopefully at some point also advice why if you use this pattern then we also suggest considering that one because they really go well together that is still on my mind it's very early at this moment but collecting all that information on patterns the good stuff that people are already doing and then just describing it giving it a good name a good picture nice visual good colors those are the best days for me uh, john yeah, good stuff. I, I can see you enjoy it. Jürgen Apollo, thank you so much for coming on the show and looking forward to seeing the next major updates to Unfix later this year. Working on it. I'll let you know. Thanks, Jürgen. Thank you.